So I learned a long time ago not to make up introductions. It's much better if you say the things about that person that that person would like you to say. And I'm going to do that first, and then I'll wing it and embarrass Bill, and then he can come up and give a talk. Uh, Bill is based in London and joined Warburg Pincus in 1988. Prior to joining the firm, he was executive vice president and director at Eberstadt Fleming. He's a director of Magnet Systems, Nuance Communications, O'Reilly Media, and Rubini Global Economics. He also is a member of the Board of Trustees of Cambridge in America, University of Cambridge, and a founding member of the Board of Managers of the Cambridge Endowment for Research in Finance. Bill is a member of the Board of Directors of the Social Science Research Council, the Board of Governors of the Institute for New Economic Thinking, which is a really good thing, and the Board of Science, Technology, and Economic Policy of the National Academy of Sciences. He is the author, as we all at FIRE know, of Doing Capitalism in the Innovation Economy, Markets, Speculation, and the State, published by Cambridge University Press in October 2012. Bill received his doctorate in economics from Cambridge University, where he was a Marshall Scholar and was valedictorian of the class of 65 at Princeton University. So Bill and I are old friends, and Bill and fire people are old friends. Bill has been here more years than I can count. We all, I think, treasure the moments when there's, we call it a conversation or an interview, but what really happens is I will turn to Bill and say, what do you think about risk? And then I just kind of look at my watch and sit back, and 29 minutes later, he's done. So um, that, I think, led to a book, which we just described. And uh, in all, it's been not just enjoyable, but really, really helpful to all of us. I'm really pleased that Bill is here with us tonight. Uh, this conversation began, as I referred earlier this evening, with a conversation by phone in which I said something like, uh, Bill, uh, how about doing the opening night talk? And by the way, the, the power of flows is our theme. Would that fit? And he immediately said, yes, for the following five reasons. And, and uh, as we talked, both he and I got more and more excited about this idea. And I think, I don't want to oversell this, but um, he is about to tell you something which will really change how you see how the world works in terms of flow and, and other things. Um, the, when I first started my career, I think, Bill, you were the first guy to find me. You have good radar. And I got this call from an AA in New York who became a good friend of ours saying, Mr. Janeway would like to have dinner with you. I had to figure out who Mr. Janeway was. And, and I said, well, that would be fascinating. I had, you know, where and when? He said, well, in, in the valley in three weeks on this certain. Okay. And, you know, we'll pay for your flight. We'll bring it down. And we'll give you a Fine. I had no idea what was happening. I, I had never met Bill. <laughs> but I thought, this is pretty interesting. So I said yes to all the questions, and I went down, and I met Bill. We had a wonderful conversation. We had a friendship ever since. And the first thing that happened after that, I think, was he invited me to keynote a Warburg Pincus uh, event, at, I think the Rainbow Room. And I did that. And I'm really happy to be exchanging keynotes back and forth. So welcome, Bill. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. And um, I have to tell you that one of the, one of the uh, emblems of which I'm extraordinarily proud is that attached to my Tumi backpack, which carries my life, is a um, brass tag with an orca on it. And it says number 100. So we do go way back. And yes, Mark told me that the theme of this fire was going to be the power of flows. And so what I'm going to talk about, and in a sense, I'm picking up on a remark that the lieutenant governor made a couple hours ago, the threatening power of flows, the threatening and disruptive power of flows, flows that can overwhelm the capacity of the political process, of social institutions, of cultural norms to manage and to adapt to them. And we're going to test whether, indeed, the green button with the arrow 
going this way does what it's supposed to do, and by God, it does. So as, as Mark said, I, um, my academic career began and has returned to economics. And what I'm showing you here is a, is a graphic, a graphic that illustrates a remarkable understanding, a conceptual understanding that was forced by the breakdown in the early 1970s of the Bretton Woods system, which allowed individual nations to set their exchange rates with other currencies while maintaining their ability to establish monetary policy interest rates, credit conditions to their own requirements. And as the post-war era led to the first wave of deregulation, money started to flow. And the thesis that was defined as the monetary trilemma said basically this very simply. You can have a fixed exchange rate, fixed rate of dollar versus pound or DMARC or yen. You can have an independent monetary policy responsive to your domestic conditions. And you can have free capital movements. Two out of three. You can't have all three at once. Now, more recently, a great political economist called Danny Roderick, who's based at Harvard, has taken that first contradiction of globalization and asserted a second and a deeper contradiction of globalization. You can have deep economic integration between countries. You can have an autonomous nation state and you can have responsive representative government, a democracy. Again, two out of three. And the stresses of globalization that we are observing around the world reflect this political trilemma. These contradictions have been driven by enormous increases in flows enabled by radical reduction in friction. Radical reductions in friction produced by IT, produced by trading systems, by global supply chains, by information flows, and by the second great wave of regulatory reform that reduced tariffs, barriers to capital, and partially integrated global labor markets. Let me give you some illustrations. So this is trade. This is goods and services. From 1995, and by the way, this is World Trade Organization data. I will promise you, you will never see an asserted fact from me without a source. From 1995 to the global financial crisis of 2008, the value of international trade run, rose from about 20% of world GDP to almost one third. That's in well under 20 years. Now let's talk about people. This is UN data. Over the past 15 years, the number of resident international migrants, the people who are now resident, these are, this is what you're looking at is, is to look at the change between 2000 and 2015. It's risen by 40 to 50% in each of these regions over the last 15 years. The 10 countries with the most migrants the most resident migrants are largely the developed countries, excluding Russia and Saudi Arabia and the Gulf, countries with representative democracies as their form of government. 
And again, note that it's the increase, the flow, that matters. And then finally, the flow of money, capital. Their change has been even more dramatic. These are comprehensive measures of international capital flows from the IMF. What you're looking at shows that up until about 1990, the growth wasn't so extraordinary in the 1980s. But between 1990 and 2007, there was an enormous increase in foreign direct investment, in portfolio investment, that stock market, buying bonds and shares. Other investment is the most dramatic. That's bank lending. Those are credit flows right up until 2007 when the global financial crisis showed most dramatically what can happen when flows get out of control. Here's another way of looking at that data. This focuses on the cross-border claims that banks have on each other and the volume, the magnitude of those claims between the different regions show you the amount. The thicker the link, the greater the volume. So for example, between 2002 and 2007, that's just five years, US banks, the claims that US banks had on European banks rose from 500 billion to 1.6 trillion. Contrarywise, the claims that European banks had on American banks rose from a trillion dollars to 2.6 trillion. It was these flows that froze in 2008-9 and produced the Great Recession. Now, let me remind you of the political trilemma. Deep integration of the markets for goods and services, the labor market, and the capital market internationally, autonomous nation states, and responsive representative government. Two out of three. Which one do you want to give up? So these are the consequences as these flows in the markets of the global financial economy spill over into the political domain. So let's first look at the politics of rising imports. This is a, from a remarkable paper by a professor at Harvard named David Autor. He's a great scholar. And I'll read just a couple of fragments from it. We find strong evidence that congressional districts exposed to larger increases in import competition disproportionately removed moderate representatives from office in the 2000s. Polarization, this is the last sentence, is also evident when breaking down districts by race. Trade exposed locations with a majority white population are disproportionately likely to replace moderate legislatures, legislators with conservative Republicans, whereas locations with a majority non-white population tend to replace moderates with liberal Democrats. The economic argument for free trade goes back to David Ricardo. It's taken for granted in every economic textbook to which every child in the world is exposed. But the politics of free trade have been all too evident in this election cycle. Let's turn to people. The economic benefits of immigration. These are two quotes from studies by two think tanks that could not be farther apart politically. The Manhattan Institute, free markets all the way, 
hard right on virtually every issue you can think of. The Economic Policy Institute, on the other hand, the second quote, basically is a child of the AFL-CIO. Manhattan Institute says immigration benefits the economy and America must adopt more flexible immigration policies that spur growth. The Economic Policy Institute provides data. Immigrants' share of total output, almost 15% in the years of the Great Recession, actually larger than the 13% share of the population. In fact, the share of immigrant workers who own small businesses is slightly higher than the comparable share among US born workers. The Manhattan Institute is at least as far to the free market right as the Economic Policy Institute is to the interventionist left, and they agree on the economic benefits of immigration. Now, this may surprise you. This is from the Pew Research Center. Most Americans agree. In 2016, this year, three quarters of all those polled included a path to citizenship as one of the appropriate ways of dealing with increased immigrant population in the United States, up from less than two thirds in the past three years. And by the way, a clear majority, a very substantial majority, don't want a wall. <laughs> but flows matter. Let's cross the pond. In Britain, the shock of June 23, the Brexit referendum vote is still resonating. It's going to go on for years, I promise you. The Economist did a very interesting analysis. They looked at the pattern of voting relative first to the proportion of the local population that were from abroad, that were not us whether from Europe or beyond Europe, beyond the, the channel. That explained nothing. London has by far the largest proportion of immigrants. Cambridge, among cities, my hometown, as Garrison Keillor puts it, Cambridge has an even higher proportion, voted overwhelmingly to stay in the European Union. It wasn't the level, it was the rate of increase. And if you were to as I dare say these slides will be available, really look at the micro data embedded in these scatter charts, you would see that the correlation is between the rate of increase, even from a very low base, to a relatively low level that helps explain the vote to leave Europe. OK, so flows can be disruptive. Flows can exceed the capacity to manage, mitigate, or adapt to them. But flows are not the only story, with all respect. Flows and stocks together. Now, this is the simplest imaginable element of a system dynamics model of a system. It happens to be financial system. Flows come in. No, I don't have a pointer, but you can see. Cash deposits come in, influenced by the interest rate, to a bank balance. Cash withdrawals for consumption or investment come out. If that bank balance is the stock that decouples the flow, stocks have different names. They're called reservoirs when it comes to rivers. They're come, called reserves in the financial system. They're sinks, they're pools. They're places where flows can accumulate and create time, latency, for people to make decisions. Without stocks, flows flow. And when they accelerate, responses are driven immediately. 
holding stocks, such as holding inventories in business supply chains, is inefficient. It ties up capital. But it also makes the system more robust. Reducing stocks increases the efficiency of each unit, each element in the system. But it makes the system more fragile. This is what economists call a coordination failure, a problem of collective action. Now, people move in months to years. Goods move in weeks to months. Money moves in micro to milliseconds. The disruptive impact of that last movement was demonstrated to everyone by the global financial crisis. So nowhere are stabilizing stocks more needed than in the global financial system. Bank capital is the buffer stock that exists internally within the system to protect the financial system against shocks, economic shocks, financial shocks, political shocks. Bank leverage is the ratio of the bank's assets to that capital. What you're looking at here is a profile of the lead-in to the moment of and the response to the global financial crisis. Bank leverage went back in the 70s from around less than 10 times. That means the assets that the bank held, their value, could decline by more than 10% and the bank was still solvent. In 2007, in 2007, bank leverage reached 35 times. That's the flow of credit that I showed you in those charts linking regions. 35 times. What that means is that less than a 3% decline in the value of the bank's assets, and it's bust. That's what happened in the winter in September 2008. Now, for each bank in the system, the rational act is to increase leverage because it increases efficiency. Each dollar of capital supports more loans and other assets, generates more income in absolute terms, higher returns on capital. Oh, and by the way, yes, more bonuses. For the system, increasing leverage reduces its robustness, especially since bank claims are inevitably short-term and subject to rapid reversal. So there's a trade-off here. There's a challenge. Efficiency versus stability. This is from a report, a book that was just published by a set of uh, extraordinary scholars uh, led by Marcus Brunemeyer, the director of the Bentheim Center for Finance at Princeton, on the Euro crisis, on the continuing on again, off again, latent, extreme crisis of the Euro. And the key phrase here is this. Counterintuitively, they write, financial deepening via a partial removal of financial frictions may actually increase financial instability by facilitating excessive capital flows. This calls for a carefully thought through macro prudential regulation of financial markets. So having lived through it, we're actually seeing that happen. We're seeing that happen through more or less coordinated action of central banks and regulators, the Bank for International Settlements in Basel. As you saw, that bank leverage is now back down to below 10 times. There is more stability and robustness in the financial system. But remember, we're not just talking about the movement of money. We're also talking about the movement of people. This is a snapshot of another buffer stock. It's the Calais jungle next door to Eurostar on the French coast, just before the train goes under the channel to the UK. 
And there are flows into these stocks. These are migrants waiting to be escorted to the registration camp in Serbia last October. So whether they occur by coordinated, thoughtful, political response, government collaboration, or whether they occur haphazardly and disruptively and destructively, accelerating flows running out of control will generate the perceived need to create buffers, circuit breakers, stocks, and reservoirs. Harold James, who's one of the authors of that book on the Euro crisis, is one of the great economists and historians of the current generation. His book, On the End of Globalization, analyzed in great detail the decline and collapse of the first globalization. Because, you know, this movie has been run before. In 1914, in 1913, up until August 1914, the global economic and financial system had reached a degree of integration never before seen. This is when a million immigrants were arriving at Ellis Island a year in the United States, when the London and New York stock exchanges were tied together, and when the first opening up, thanks to technology, the steamship, the iron, the steel steamship, was bringing goods across oceans that had previously had mi minor flows of trade. Over the next generation, from 1914 to 1935, 36, that globalization ended. And what Harold is doing here is pulling out some lessons from that experience to where we are now. And he says the, the phenomenon of globalization has become a ubiquitous way of understanding the world, but people who use the concept fail to understand its volatility and instability. Globalization not only involves the international movements of goods, people, and capital, but also the transfer of ideas and technology, and I might add, legitimately and illegitimately. Globalization generates continuous uncertainty about values, both in the monetary and a more fundamental sense. It's vulnerable to periodic financial catastrophes, which involve very sudden alterations of concepts of value. And what Harold is saying here is not just financial value, not just the, the value of an asset. And he brings this to a conclusion by saying, Politics and economics are inextricably and inherently licked, and politics provides an alternative to market mechanisms for the management of globalization crises. Whether through coherent, thoughtful, step-by-step -step response, or through populist rebellions, there will be a political response. And when breakdowns occur, Reconstruction is extremely difficult and involves a long and arduous effort for the rebuilding of social trust. Sounds relevant to me. So we're living in a paradox of politics. Securing financial stability, regenerating economic prosperity, these depend on political interventions from governments deemed to be untrustworthy by substantial constituencies around the world. Now, disruptive as these financial flows have been, and potentially, and in some cases actually, as destructive as these political spillovers have been, there's another flow we're living with, with a potentially far greater and cumulatively irreversible ex existential crisis. 
This graphic, there are many equivalent of the CO2 cycle, is a snapshot of a complex evolving system whose behavior is subject to nonlinear emergent properties. Almost impossible to define in any sort of deterministic way. The flows of human-generated carbon dioxide now are overwhelming nature's capacity to buffer the climate. You don't have to be a climate scientist to appreciate the evidence. So how do we increase the buffer stock in response? What is available? Now, Mark has come up with a rather extraordinarily but characteristically creative idea, the graphene trifecta. Graphene is pretty terrific stuff. It's a miracle material. It fixes carbon chemically, and therefore, potentially, ecologically, it fixes the runaway carbon cycle. It has unique qualities, a myriad of potential applications. It's a very challenging place for a venture capitalist and an entrepreneur just because it takes a long time. It will take a long time, to, just as was the case with silicon, to make this stuff at large scale and to find out and explore the space for the killer applications that will lead to very large scale use. And it's important to note that we've got, we've, we've got a way to go. This is a, a forecast um, from a reasonably respectable research source in Nona uh, last year of the likely growth of the graphene, in, of graphene usage in terms of market revenues. And the question is not, is this the future? It's how do we make that future completely irrelevant? How do we radically accelerate that growth by orders of magnitude? So, as Mark and most anybody else who's heard me talk at fire before knows, I think history is important and that it matters. And the answer now is that we've done it before. OK, so this is aluminum. 1940, 260,000 tons. That's total global production in the United States from all sources, primary, secondary, recycling, et cetera. Well, aluminum was a critical material. 70% of the weight of a military airframe in 1940 was aluminum. Every B-17 used 10 tons of aluminum. A public-private part uh, partnership, which had its own acronym, was called GOCO. Remember that term. We may rediscover it. Government-owned, contractor-operated. In three years, we increased aluminum production by a factor of four. In fact, we increased it so fast that it peaked in 43 because we were building too goddamn many airplanes. We had more bombers and fighters than we had pilots. And the planes started piling up on the airports near the plants rather than get over to Europe or across the Pacific. With demobilization, after the war, production flatlined, but then came Korea. And then came the remobilization in the context of the emergent Cold War. And again, production doubled in four years from a much higher base. And again, it was a public-private partnership. We did it another time. We did it with silicon. And that, I'm out of order. Excuse me for a moment. In 53, US Defense Department accounted for 25% of total industry R&D. And it spread this money around in a very interesting mode. By 1953, it was clear that computing mattered and that the applications of computing mattered. And we went through, 
we went through a very interesting learning experience. So the physicists in this room, I think, can confirm that a semiconductor material called germanium has higher electron transfer than silicon. IBM, the incumbent, the dominant information processing equipment supplier in the country and the world, bet on germanium. Bloody impossible to make. Really difficult. And DOD was an experimental exercise. And they went and found some guys down in Houston, Texas Instruments. And they heard about some breakaways, some tearaways out of Bell Labs who got some money out of Sherman Fairchild. That's why it was called Fairchild Semiconductor. And they decided that it was worthwhile hedging the bets on germanium with a bet on silicon. And over the next 20 years, the Defense Department both funded the R&D, not only it funded the R&D, it was the lead customer for material that was too unreliable, too costly for commercial applications. IBM's computers in the 1960s used virtually no silicon. IBM was very late, and the Defense Department actually wound up brokering a shotgun marriage between Texas Instruments and IBM whereby TI transferred its silicon technology to IBM, and IBM committed to buy everything that TI could make for the next three years. As well, this is also not irrelevant to today's world and thinking about graphene, DOD required that the intellectual property that was generated with its money be shared. Patent owners were required to license on a fair and non-discriminatory basis their technology to others. Producers of critical elements, critical devices, had to participate in creating a second source because there was a mission, the Cold War, reinforced particularly after Sputnik in 1957 and the creation of DARPA that legitimized this kind of government intervention to drive innovation at a pace far faster than could possibly have been delivered by competitive free markets. So we did it twice before. Can we do it again? Well, it's a wonderful new book for those interested in history. Inverting Schumpeter's great phrase, the book is called Destructive creation, not creative destruction, destructive creation. And it's how mobilization for World War II became the vehicle for these kinds of, these public-private partnerships that accelerated technological innovation, not just invention, but innovations that were economically transformative. Wilson, the author, says, some have suggested that absent the crisis of an all-out global war, the public will never endorse the sort of dramatic government intervention that occurred in the 1940s. And then he reflects on that by saying, rejection of targeted governmental intervention has delayed, if not prevented entirely, an adequate response to a major global environmental crisis. So in contrast, I put up here a quote from Lamar Smith, a man who has great, significant position in Washington today because he's chairman of the House Science Committee. And he said last year, we've now had close to 18 years of global warming, even though carbon dioxide emissions have increased of no global warming. No global warming is his perception. Even though carbon dioxide emissions have increased 25%, over the last 18 years. And then, I'll pass through this very quickly without any comment, there's this. So, the question of whether we can do it again is, we better. We better. This is the data that Lamar Smith hasn't been paying attention to. And I was reminded in conversation when we were outside, 
and chatting a little bit about this. And some would say, well, you know, late last year, wasn't there a gathering in Paris where the Europeans and the US and even the Chinese kind of got together and said, we better take this stuff seriously? And so I leave you with the thought, at least we'll always have Paris. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>